I welcome Dr. Giles Tillotson in our midst today. He will be speaking to us on art and ingenuity at the Jaipur court. A few words about Dr. Tillotson. He read philosophy, history of art, and oriental studies at Trinity College, Cambridge, and was a research fellow at Peterhouse, Cambridge. He taught for 14 years at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, University of London, where he became reader in history of art and chair of art and archeology. span Since 2011, he has been consultant director at the Maharaja Savai Man Singh II Museum in the City Palace in Jaipur. He is a fellow and former director of the Royal Asiatic Society, London. He visited India in 1979 as a year off student on a teaching assignment and returned frequently before finally setting down, settling down in India in 2004. His books written for general audiences including his Golden Triangle Trilogy, Delhi Darshan, The History of Monuments of India's Capital, Taj Mahal and Jaipur Nama Tales from the Pink City, all published by Penguin India. The collection of the Maharaja Savai Man Singh II Museum in the City Palace in Jaipur include arms and armor, textiles and garments, furniture, paintings and early photograph photographs, all donated to the trust by the late Maharaja Savai Bhavani Singh and by his father, after whom the trust is named. The museum displays examples of all these types of courtly objects and has an ongoing program to open new galleries. I do not wish to stand between the speaker and the audience, so may I now request Dr. Giles Tillotson to address the gathering. Thank you very, very much. Enjoy this evening. Thank you very much, Rosa. Um, Jason, could you get someone to start the PPT for me, please? Uh, five seconds. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me to contribute to this Museum Society series. Um, and uh, my condolences on your loss. Um, I didn't have the privilege of meeting the late Mrs. Mehta, but I hope that she would have approved of what I'm about to, uh, to present. Of course, like many museum workers, I'm sad not to be able to get into my museum at the moment. In fact, the City Palace is open to visitors who can get there, but uh, regrettably, I'm stuck in Gurgaon. So it's great for me to have this opportunity to share some of its treasures with perhaps a new audience. Could I have the first slide, please, Ami? Among the Maharajas of Jaipur, the best known are probably the first and the last. Maharaja Savai Jai Singh II, who founded the city in 1727 and is remembered most especially as an astronomer king, and Maharaja Savai Man Singh II, internationally famous as a polo player in the 1930s and friend of foreign royalty. Next slide, please. Both of them commissioned paintings. For instance, this large painting on cloth depicting the Govindev temple made for Sawai Jai Singh II, and this illustration of the classic poem Megdut by Kali Das, painted for Sawai Man Singh II. Next. But I want to focus on a Maharaja who came in between, Maharaja Sawai Pratap Singh, who ruled from 1778 to 1803, seen here in two fine portraits by the court artist Sahib Ram, because his patronage of the arts accomplished something exceptional, even by Jaipur standards, which has something to do with his special aesthetic sensibilities. He sought, I think, to achieve a combination or collaboration between different art forms in order to create something greater than the sum of its parts. Next, please. Sawai Pratap Singh inherited the towering Chandra Mahal and spacious courtyards that were built by the founder, all of which he used. Next, please. Including the palace garden, Jai Niwas, at the center of which stands the temple of Govindev with an image of Krishna as the cowherd that had been uh, central to the worship of his ancestors and people since the 16th century. Sawai Pratap Singh wrote poetry under the pen name Brajnidi, 
a name which indicates his devotion to Lord Krishna, we have in the museum several manuscripts of collections of his verses. Next, please. One of his first additions to the palace was a series of wall paintings in a small shrine originally dedicated to the worship of another form of Krishna, Srinathji. Though small, it's a remarkably complete and well-preserved painted interior. Next, please. The paintings in the lower panels show scenes of court life, depicting recognizable spaces of the palace complex and invariably featuring the young Maharaja watching an animal fight, perhaps, or supervising a display of his artillery from the safety of a balcony or carriage. Next. His unbearded face indicates that he was still a child. He came to the throne at the age of 13, so we may deduce that these murals were painted no later than around 1780. He's there in the center, as you can see. Next, please. The niches above in the same room have other palace scenes. These are idealized courts, which yet in their details and general arrangement still seem to evoke the city palace. Their inhabitants are no longer Sawai Pratap Singh and his courtiers, but Krishna and Radha and their female companions. An idea propagated by the founder of Jaipur is that the Maharaja is really only the minister serving the real ruler who is Krishna. And in these images, Krishna seems to take them at their word, occupying their palace. Their world becomes his. But this cuts both ways. By inviting him into their palace, they create a world that they share with him, erasing the boundary between royal and divine space. Next, please. Sai Pratap Singh is best known for adding the Hawa Mahal, or Palace of the Winds, whose fanciful facade is one of the city's iconic constructions. A court poem celebrating the building describes it not, as modern commentators do, as a grandstand from which to observe processions in the street below, but as a mountain of beauty made by the king of the world, Pratap, and as a trysting place for lovers, and especially for Krishna and Radha. The central section of the poem says, there is a hustle and bustle in the Hawa Mahal where the lovers Radha and Krishna have arrived, and it ends with their union. For many hours, the lovers' breaths are intertwined, and the poem suggests it's this which gives the Hawa Mahal its name. Next, please. Standing at the foot of the Hawa Mahal is the thematically related temple of Govardhanath, also built by Sai Pratap Singh. And next, around the square, known as Chandni Chowk, at the southern entrance to the palace, are three more temples built by him. To the west is the Braj Nidhi, the wealth of Braj, a name which that alludes both to Krishna, of course, as the Lord of Vrindavan, and to Pratap himself, who adopted that sobriquet as his pen name. Next, facing it on the east side of the square is the Krishna Bihari temple, while on the south, adjacent to the Tripolia gate, is the Sri Pratapeshwara temple, a Shiva, Shiva shrine, next please, whose name is again layered, referring to the god as the Lord of Pratap, the patron. It contains a family group of images with a distinctive Jaipur version of Shiva as a young man sitting at his ease. The four temples are less well known than the Hawa Mahal, but are active places of worship, and together they established Sawai Pratap Singh as a major patron of architecture. Next. I turn now to two series of paintings of illustrations to sacred texts produced in the court of Sawai Pratap Singh, starting with a selection taken from a 365 folio series illustrating the Dashna Skanda of the Bhagavad Puran, completed in 1792. The Bhagavad Puran, as I'm sure you all know, is an encyclopedic text dedicated to Vishnu. Its longest and most popular section is the 10th book, which is mostly concerned with the story of Krishna. In one of the first images, we see the moments following the birth of Krishna. Celestial beings at the top of the image shower blessings on the imprisoned parents, Devaki and Vasudev, and their infant, while outside the, the, at the bottom, the guards sleep. The color scheme of this night scene is appropriately somber, except for, next, the upper chamber, illuminated by Krishna's radiance, where the parents worship the newborn who is miraculously already dressed in characteristic style. But with the evil King Kansa awaiting the birth as eagerly as the, the parents, they can't afford to hang about. And in the very next folio, next slide please, Vasudev wraps up Krishna 
who is now a normal naked infant, albeit of course blue, and carries him on a bed across the river Yamna to Gokul, where he places the child beside the sleeping Yashoda and returns with Yashoda's daughter as the substitute. The technique of continuous visual narration, the principal actor of the scene, Vasudev and Krishna, appears five times in a single image, was widely used in Rajput court painting. The angry snake of lightning in the sky that threatens this delicate operation on a stormy night is thematically answered by the protective snake, Sheshnag, raising its hoods to ensure their safe passage. But the artist seems as much concerned with the sleeping cattle and cowherds of Gokul, including, next please, outside Yashoda's house, this charming little vignette detail. Next please. There are many pastoral scenes to illustrate this phase of Krishna's childhood. The artists are careful to include a strip of river at the bottom to remind us where we're supposed to be um, on the banks of, of the Jamna in Vrindavan. But in conveying the details of bullock carts and carriages and sunrises diffused by outcrops of rocky hills, they draw on the world immediately around them. This Vrindavan is located in 18th century Rajasthan. Next, please. Another of the pastoral scenes showing Krishna and the other boys with their herds during the autumn season has an even more arresting local detail. The composition is similar to the last with the ribbon of river, river in the foreground, um, the, uh, the village figures gathered on its back and an idealized landscape behind. But notice how the figure of Krishna as he moves from left to right across the page and then pauses to play his flute is subtly transformed. He starts out on the left as Bal Gopal, the companion of Baldev, but he comes to a halt as Govindev. Next, please. In the detail where he plays the flute, he's very distinctly depicted as the image in the Govindev temple located in the garden of Jaipur city palace. The artist is reminding us that Krishna's home is Jaipur quite as much as Vrindavan. Next. There are similar regional references in the artist's depiction of architecture. Several folios are devoted to the story of Sudama, the childhood friend who goes in search of Krishna, having fallen on hard times. Here he reaches Krishna's palace at Dwarka. The diminutive and obviously impoverished Sudama is shown passing through the outer courtyard of the guards at the bottom and through yet more uh, gateways in the center of the image. Next to be warmly embraced by his old friend Krishna and to have his feet bathed while he's seated in a splendid pavilion. The layout of the palace, its architectural details and decorative elements are generic, but the artist knows about them because his patron occupies a palace of this type. The artist frequently visited the palace to observe and record its rituals and festivities. So it would be an easy matter for a Jaipur artist with no ambition to convey a sense of antiquity or of the past to conjure a palace for Krishna. All he had to do was model it loosely on the city palace and add more gold. I've been calling the artist he, but in this case we know his name, Sali Gram. While the majority of the folios bear no artist names, about a third of them are attributed to individuals. Ten names appear repeatedly. They are Ram Sevak, Gopal, Uday, Pokama, Sali Gram, Gasi, Jeevan, Chiman, Raju and Sitaram. Of course, it's possible that there are other unnamed artists involved. Sadigram, as I've suggested, somewhat diffused the visual reference to the city palace by making Krishna's palace gold. His colleague Ram Sevak, by contrast, next slide please, was content to deploy Jaipur's signature pink color to place the bathing gopis firmly in his patron's domain. Bathing in a river in the countryside is all very well, but who would not be more comfortable with a Jaipur pav pavilion at hand? Somewhere to get dressed again. Next, please. Next slide, please. Eat and chat, or just wring out your hair. That little detail, by the way, prefigures a motif that recurs through Jaipur painting for the next two generations. Next. A little bit of Jaipur architecture, the corner tower of a garden, turns up in the depiction of the rainy season but this folio is much more remarkable for the treatment of the landscape. Curling monsoon clouds mass over distant rocky hills from which rivulets weave their way down into a flooded plain. In the foreground, peacocks and a monkey clamber over rocks. 
while other birds explore the banks of a stream that winds past the cattle into the middle distance. Krishna and his companions are mere adjuncts in a painting that is more about landscape than it is about them. Sadly, this painting carries no attribution. So for the moment, let's call its painter the master of the meanders. Next, please. The final folio of the series depicts the education of the Yadav children by the artist Gasi. In the right foreground, beyond some well-tended flower beds, a large assembly of brightly dressed young people, boys and girls together, are seated under a scarlet awning stretched over a platform or terrace in front of an elegant building that includes a shrine to Ganesh. Many are hard at work, reading or writing on slates. The gold and purple embroidered chicks between the arches repeated on the roof pavilion add to the sense of splendor and privilege. A similar scene plays out in front of the building immediately behind and across the broad and well-swept street, other groups cluster in front of grand mansions that recede into the distance towards a gate. Beyond that lies a vast city, ostensibly Dwarka, with temple towers rising amid the houses and here and there, a tower reminiscent of Jaipur's famous Isar Lat. Beyond the city flows a broad river dotted with vessels and bound by the distant bank. All of this is shown in an aerial perspective that is almost unprecedented in Rajasthani art of this period and which suggests an acquaintance on Gassi's part with European art that must have been direct, not second hand through the Mughal encounter. The view resembles topographical depictions of European cities made in the same century. If in our mind's eye, we replace the temple towers with church spires, we would have a pretty convincing contemporary view of Vienna with the Danube flowing by. But what was the source of such a visual scheme? Next, please. A likely source is Hosman's Grosser Atlas, published in Nuremberg in 1725, a copy of which was presented to Sawai Jaising by the Jesuit community in Jaipur. It's still in the collection. It includes, among many other images, views of urban Nuremberg. Next. And aerial views of many cities in Europe. No image in the atlas is a precise match to Garcia's painting. So if this is, is indeed the source, then rather to his credit, Garcia has not copied um, or adapted a specific view to his new purpose, but has instead assimilated their mode of viewing. Next, please. The second great series of paintings produced at the court of Sawai Pratap Singh is a Devi Mahatmya, comprising 102 folios completed in 1799. This time, every single folio is attributed. Broadly, the group of artists is the same with a few changes. Three names disappear, and there are three new arrivals, Lakshman, Radhakrishnan, and Ramkishan. The story, as you all know, tells how the gods, threatened by a demon that they cannot subdue, together create a special goddess or Devi expressly for the purpose. In this folio by Sally Graham, the, art, the gods are shown assembled on a jewel studded Mount Kailash to collectively breathe the goddess into existence. As they exhale their energies, she's incarnated as a golden vision above their heads. Vishnu and Shiva preside seated at the mouth of a cave on a carpeted dais that looks as though it's been borrowed from a Mughal or Deccani palace. Their mounts, Garuda and Nandi, stand nearby. Next. Shiva in this painting, as indeed throughout the series and in much of Jaipur painting in general, is shown as a youthful, almost boyish figure, somewhat reminiscent of the Murti in the Sri Prateshwa temple at the entrance to the palace. As with Krishna becoming Govindev, there's an attempt to particularize the great Indian god and claim him for Jaipur. Next, please. At this point in the story, Devi, having defeated various minion de demons that have been sent by Mahishasur, rides out to meet him, meet, meet the great demon himself. He demonstrates his power by smashing mountains as she looks coolly on. This work by Gopal is on display in our gallery alongside others that come before and after it in the sequence by other artists in the group. Comparing them, it's obvious that the artist who worked on the series had a meeting in which they agreed certain details, the style and color of Davy's helmet and clothing, the saddlery of her tiger and the design of her armaments and so on, 
and then they've gone away and used those details each in his own way. Stylistically, they're very varied. Unlike some others in the group, for example, Gopal seems to have been taken by uh, the passionate manner of depicting hills, something he could have observed in Mughal paintings belonging to the Maharaja. Next. Jumping back to the beginning of the series, this folio depicts King Surat being advised by a sage to worship Devi in order to recover his wealth. Surat was supposedly an emperor of ancient Bengal, but there's no attempt here to convey a distant past or realm. On the contrary, the repeated figure of Surat seems to be modeled on Sawai Pratap Singh. The artist is painting his patron into the narrative. This folio is by Gasi, who we met just now as the master of the Viennese Dwarka, but with its winding landscape and waterways, its bird-filled streams and distant horizon, it also recalls the hand of, next slide please, the artist I call the master of the meanders. Is it possible they're one and the same? I think so. I'm going to compare two more folios by Gopal and Gasi with respect to their backgrounds. Next. So here's Gopal again, depicting the Devi as Kali, butchering demons. All his focus is on her wiry ferocity and on the mangled mess of her opponents. The landscape background is almost perfunctory with just an orange tinge to see, save it from tediousness. The landscape is not what this is about. Next. But when Garci tackles Shumba's charge, he pushes the demon far into the background and sets the Devi on her tiger to one side to allow space for a sensational landscape, which includes his hallmark birds and winding waterways, here combined with pale rocks and a crocodile popping its head above the water. In the background, diminishing hills and trees convey a sense of immense distance. Next. When Ram Sevak treats a similar theme, all his focus is on the demon who turns to the, the viewer to make sure that we have noticed him. The Devi seems not so much furious in battle as mildly irritated. Another day, another demon. And in his treatment of the landscape, Ram Sevak is of the same mind as Gopal, that he had discussed the Devi's gold-bordered white sari with Garsi, next, who is faithful to their agreement. In this scene, the Devi is not killing a demon, just sending him away with a flea in his ear. He had come with a proposal of marriage from his master, and she tells him that she will marry only the one who can defeat her. Garci can concoct a monstrous demon as well as any of his colleagues, but he does not stop at that. He places him again in a vast landscape of lakes and mountains, enlivened by birds and a crocodile. There are mixed perspectives here, as in many of Garci's works. The foreground doesn't tie up with the background, making it unsettlingly impossible to gauge the space beyond registering it as vast. The naturalistic perspective of the far background creates a landscape that is, in the circumstances, strangely real. For me, Garci emerges as the most ingenious artist of Sawai Pratap Singh's court. There are many other paintings in the collection from his reign, far too many to um, even give an overview. I want to discuss just one more. It's a work by Sahib Ram, the chief court artist. In view of his status, I come to Sahib Ram belatedly, the fact is that he seems not to have been involved in the production of the two great series discussed. As we shall see, he was busy on other matters. Next, please. One of the best known drawings from Jaipur at the time of Sawai Pratap Singh is now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. This drawing was one of many acquired by the art historian A.K. Kumaraswamy in 1911 from descendants of Sahib Ram. In his book on Rajput painting, Kumaraswamy connects the drawing with a large painting which he claims to have seen in the Maharaja's library. Next, please. So this is it. The painting depicts the Ras Lila, the dance of Radha and Krishna. Together, its two panels measure 13 feet across. The figures are almost life-size. The gold used abundantly in the clothing, especially of the two principal figures, is gold leaf. This is, by a considerable margin, the largest and the most expensive painting ever produced at the Jaipur court and I venture to suggest in Rajasthan. As has been pointed out, the figure in the drawing and the corresponding figure in the painting is not actually Krishna, but a dancing girl dressed as Krishna. The flowing hair and prominent bust indicate her femininity. 
Her companion is dressed as Rada. They're flanked by two groups of vocalists and instrumentalists. So more accurately, it's a depiction of a performance of the Ras Lila at the court of Sawai Pratap Singh. Next, please. Some of the details included by Saibaram seem to reinforce the point that it's a painting of a performance. There's a slight change in hue between the main figure's face and hands and her arms. Krishna, of course, is blue. So a woman playing his role would apply makeup to her face and hands and wear tight fitting sleeves on her arms. Hence the difference, which the artist might have concealed, but on the contrary, has faithfully portrayed. Next. Some of the musicians bear three line tripundra marks on their foreheads. These are marks of devotion to Shiva. That they bear them while performing a Vaishnavite drama reminds us that even as they pose as gopis, they, re they remain real court women with personal religious affiliations. If you get up really close, you can see those with parted lips have palm stained teeth. Despite his flat, unmodel style of painting, Sahib Ram is showing us real women. We do not know their names, but Sahib Ram knew these people as fellow artists at the court. Next, please. A poem composed at the end of Sawai Pratap Singh's reign, Pratap Prakash, tells us that he used the terrace in front of the Sukhniwas as a setting for dance performances. The floor was covered with white sheets and the musicians accompanied the singers and dancers. We have then a composite or total work of art. Sawai Pratap Singh commissions musicians and dancers to perform a Ras Lila on a terrace of his palace. He commissions his court artist to make a depiction of the performance as the, to complement it and he composes a poem declaring that Krishna's home in Jaipur is the Chandra Mahal. Architecture, music, dance, painting, and and poet, next piece. So those who have the eyes, the forms, but the sounds and movements of the players. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, thanks. But there's another overlap, the overlap in play here, which Sahib Rab, um, points to directly. Sorry, I, I, it was me that was lost. Can you go back to the, to the, to the painting, Ami? There's another overlap at play here, which Sahib Rab, to, Sahib Rab points to directly. As she dances, the principal woman becomes Krishna. She has his halo. Krishna is imminent in her. But at the same time, she remains her quotidian costume self. So the divine and courtly worlds are merged. Next slide, please. I turn next to works produced at the court of a later ruler, Maharaja Sawai Ram Singh II, who ruled in the 19th century from 1835 to 1880. Though he merits at least as much attention as his great grandfather, I have time today for only a few points in pursuance of my main theme. Next, please. Early in his reign, during the 1840s, when Sai Ram Singh was still a child and perhaps not in full charge of the system of patronage, court artists seemed to be attempting a throwback to the days of Sai Pratap Singh with ambitious projects in the illustration of sacred texts. This painting, showing the murder of Draupadi's sons, is one from a very fragmentary series illustrating the Mahabharat. The distant landscape, seen in aerial perspective, shows how Gasi, who must have been long dead, was still remembered at the Jaipur court and effective as a source of, in, of in, um, inspiration. The action all takes place in the bottom right corner. The rest of the cosmo, uh, composition places the incident in a setting that is again generically, not precisely, reminiscent of Jaipur. It's as if we are in some vision or memory of Mansaga, of the road to Amer transformed by moonlight. Next, please. Another painting from around the same time is one in a series of large unfinished works. This depicts Svaglok, or heaven, as a celestial palace for the gods. The palace comprises seven concentric courtyards. This may not be immediately obvious, as the outer six are compressed to fit them on the page, but it's apparent on careful scrutiny. It's a Shastric idea, of course, the seven courtyard palace of the King of Kings. Jaipur City Palace is made up of, of, of many courtyards, um, not concentric like this, but contiguous, as that's the more efficient use of space. But the palace and the image derive from the same paradigm. Indeed, they're even more closely related. Next slide, please. The artist has conceived heaven not just as 
any seven courtyard palace, but as a transformed Jaipur city palace, he derived the architectural forms and details from those that surround him, multiplied and turned into gold. Next. Then in the 1860s and 70s, the visual arts of Jaipur were transformed as a result of a direct intervention by the Maharaja as a practitioner of photography. I must recapitulate the backstory briefly for any of you who might not be aware of it. Next slide, please. Uh, that, that Maharaja Sawe Ram Singh was not just a patron and collector of photography, but an accomplished practitioner um, of the wet collodion glass plate technique was something well known to and commented on by his contemporaries, including the French traveler and photographer Louis Rousselet, the Times journalist William Russell, and the artist Valentine Princess. A diary that Ram Singh kept through much of 1870, which we have translated, shows that in the later part of his life, his Tasya Khana, or photo studio, occupied a prominent part of his life. But when he died in 1880, the studio was sealed, and Sawe Ram Singh's pioneering work as an artist in this medium was all but forgotten. Next slide, please. In the 1980s, Sawe Ram Singh's photographic equipment was rediscovered by the then director and the keeper of the museum, Dr. Ashok Das and Yadavendra Sahai. They printed and displayed enlargements of some of the, of the photographs and published articles and a short book, attracting the attention of specialists in the history of photography in India, as diverse in their approaches as John Falconer, Chris Pinney, and Gayatri Sinha. Next, please. In 2012, we made digital copies of all 2,000 glass plate negatives in the collection. We're not able to put them online, but it, it greatly facilitates studying and reproduction. In 2015, we included the selection of 50 of Sawai Ram Singh's portraits and landscapes alongside some of his cameras and works by his contemporaries in our new painting and photography gallery in the museum. Please do, do go and see this gallery if you haven't already done so when you're, when you're next able to travel. Next slide, please. The essay in the accompanying catalog written by my colleague, Manali Venkateshwaran, represents what is, for now, the current state of our knowledge. There are challenges in moving knowledge forward, and there are some major questions which are, await answers. Next slide, please. Dr. Das and Sahai mentioned discovering thousands of Sawai Ram Singh's prints. Today, we have many, pr many prints by other photographers of his time, including Vaughan and Shepard and Naladin Dayal, but there were none of his own when I joined the museum in 2011. So when and why were the prints dispersed? Not all of the negatives in the collection are by Sawai Ram Singh. A handful are signed by other photographers, such as T. Murray and J.E. Sachet, fellow photographers that we know he met. He seems to have persuaded them to part with negatives for his collection. So exactly which are by him and which not? Have some of the negatives been dispersed too, like the prints, or even destroyed? With the help of a local collector, we've recently found evidence for this not negatives, but vintage prints whose context points firmly to Sawe Ram Singh, but for which we do not hold the negatives, so somebody else does. Who are the unidentified sitters in the portraits? Sahai named several in his book, and Dr. Das tells us that some of the women were Maharanis, but they don't tell us how they knew. The website, Getty Images, has several photographs attributed to Sawe Ram Singh, but on what basis, we can only guess. Next, please. There are more such questions, but we're developing strategies to answer them. We recently collaborated, collaborated with Rehab Alana of the Al Qazi Foundation to display a selection of 125 images from the archive at the Government Art Institution in Jaipur, Jawahar Kendra, and later in Triveni Kala Sangram in Delhi. This complements smaller but similar collaborations, such as with the Science Museum in London and with the Vancouver Art Gallery. Each time we put Sawe Ram Singh into the public domain, people with specialist knowledge come forward to contribute information and ideas. In this way, we will correct our errors and plug the gaps. But that's ongoing, and it's too early to report success. I want to focus on just one aspect of Sawe Ram, Ram Singh's work, where I feel I work, walk on more solid ground, his images of buildings in and around Jaipur. Next, please. There are nearly 200 views of Amir in Jaipur by Sawe Ram Singh in the collection. Some direct our attention to places that he might, might be thought obvious, but from an unusual perspective. His view of Sawe, um, Sawe Pratap Singh's Hawamahal, already an iconic building of the city, 
photographed by others, such as Colin Murray, working for Bourne and Shepherd, is not the standard uncluttered picture postcard view with the open space of Bari Chopar in the foreground, but one where the Hawa Mahal is pushed into the background and our eye is detained by a stonemason's yard. We may think that Jaipur is picturesque. Sawai Ram Singh seems to tell us that he thinks of it as a work in progress. Next, please. Another distant view of the Hawa Mahal looks at it from behind so that it's set against the hills of Galta. The high vantage point used here is the clock tower that Sawai Ram Singh himself had built in the outer courtyard of the city palace. This view viewpoint prompts a series of distinctions. It's one thing to photograph a building as we might photograph the Taj Mahal, or indeed Sawai Ram Singh might photograph a palace in Lucknow. It's another thing to photograph a building that you own, as we might photograph our own house, or Sawai Ram Singh might photograph his palace. Next, please. There's an element of the proprietorial gaze that's only enhanced by the elevated viewpoint. In this case, the top of the Issa Lat on Tripolia Bazaar. Sawai Ram Singh here surveys his domestic domain from the Zanana beneath his feet to the Jal Mahal on the distant lake. Is it too far-fetched, by the way, to think that he too was inspired by the paintings of Ghassi in his collection? But to pursue my distinctions, next please. It's yet a third thing and a distinct thing to photograph a building that you yourself have caused to be built. Sawai so Ram Singh did this repeatedly. Here is the clock tower that he had earlier climbed to photograph the Hawa Mahal, now presented as the main subject. Next, please. And here is Mayo Hospital, commissioned by Sawai Ram Singh, designed by Dr. De Fabek, completed in 1875, and named in honor of the Rajput-friendly Viceroy, Lord Mayo. The hospital occupies part of the public gardens, Ramni Wasbarg, which Sawai Ram Singh also commissioned and named after himself. Renalini has suggested that such images of works accomplished, and there are many more, including of the garden, are the princely state counterpart to images by colonial photographers like Bourne and Shepherd depicting great imperial works like steel railway bridges over rivers. Rehab invites us to read them as chapters in a visual autobiography, another form of self-portraiture, if you will. I see them as doubling the creative act. You build a building and then you photograph it. Photography and architecture must merge. It's as though the building is only truly complete once its builder has photographed it. It's the counterpart to Sawai Pratap Singh commissioning a poem about the Hawa Mahal. Next, please. Sadly, Sawai Ram Singh did not live to see and photograph his greatest architectural commission, the Albert Hall, completed after his death in 1887. But he did photograph what must surely be its foundation laying ceremony in 1876. Next, please. Work on Sawai Ram Singh's oeuvre is ongoing. Others took to photography in his wake and other kinds of merger were attempted, notably with painting. In some studios in Jaipur, the roles of painter and photographer overlapped, for example, in the production of painted photographic portraits, a genre that continued through the next two reigns. So I end where I began with an image of Maharaja Sawai Man Singh II. But I hope I've persuaded you along the way that two of his predecessors, Sawai Pratap Singh in the 18th century and Sawai Ram Singh in the 19th were more than great patrons of courtly art. Each was also an artist in his chosen medium and the collaborations that they promoted between the artists were ingenious and even visionary. The works from the reign of Sawai Pratap Singh that I've shown you point to a conscious attempt to display a range of arts in creating a coherent self-referential world, a space where the gods come home to a landscape full of the recognizable palace courtyards, painted walls, and tapering towers of Jaipur. And the presiding hero moving from mural to manuscript is the king. I still wonder, is this different in degree or kind from what was going on elsewhere? And what was its wider purpose? Was it an attempt to escape the reality of politically unstable times by creating an alternative world of art, a Pratap Leela played out under divine protection? Sawai Ram Singh lived in more secure times when the kingdom fell under the protection of the British Raj. But in that context too, if differently, he faced the challenge of asserting meaning and power. And he seems to have aimed at something comparable, creating both in reality and through his photography, the model of a modernizing rebuilding state presided over by a multifaceted king. Last slide, please. 
I hope it's also apparent that this evening I've been the spokesperson for a team of curators and conservators who work together to build our understanding. Even so, um, I feel we're still only scratching the surface. I've already pointed to gaps in our knowledge of the photography of Sawai Ram Singh. Much more work is needed on Sawai Pratap Singh's poetry as well as his patronage of painting and music. And we're delighted that more and more scholars from India and abroad now regularly come and help us with this work when they're able to. Thank you all very much for your attention.